Okay, so today we are be we'll be discussing on chapter 13, which is talks about uh, why uh, reactivity. Though in the previous chapter, we have looked at some certain aspects uh, of reactivity, which is more uh, intuitive. But in this chapter, we're going to go in deeper to broaden our knowledge and understanding of uh, the reactivity, the, the reactive uh, programming uh, using Shining. So in the introduction part of the book, in the introduction part of the book, it first says that uh, Shiny is magic. Uh, and I do agree because uh, if you start uh, a, developing a Shiny app, first we need to write some few, you will need to uh, really understand the logic in the sense that we are writing our R code, but without even a background in other uh, aspects of programming like the JavaScript, we can just start a simple app and the output is being transformed into an app. So the book also talk about that specifically it is, it is good uh, magic because it uses simple concepts that combine in a consistent way in order for us to be able to uh, generate uh, the Shiny app. So going to the first part of the book, talk about uh, why do we need a uh, reactive programming. Here in the book, it do describe a reactivity as a, that focus on changes, that is values that changes over time. And also we talk about a uh, calculation and action that depends on those values. Uh, yeah, I, I give for an instance that we have de developed a shiny app. You know, the users, we are going to interact uh, with those shiny app. We are going to drag the slider. Uh, we, we are going to maybe upload uh, a CSV file. So all these things that are happening in the app is going to what trigger uh, the, the server. The reactivity is going to take place in the server because the server need to track those changes in which the user, the way the user is being interacting uh, with the app. So the server is going to track those changes and is going to return a value. And the book also went further to define reactivity. It said the reactive programming is concerned with data streams and, and the data propagation of changes. So you know when down for that, I said, why are uh, reactive programming in Shiny? Here we see that Shiny application are interactive. Just as I said earlier, the user need to interact with the app. They need to supply inputs to the, and the server section. We are going to see how this input in which as the user is interacting with the app, we are going to see how the server is going to react to those inputs and, and give us a return, a return value. The book also went further to say that need something dynamic, unlike most our code. Yes, we do agree Shiny app is dynamic because it deals with value because we can have value that changes over time, unlike our normal basic R code, in which we need to just run the script, which is more in order for us to see the return value. Why in Shiny? The difference is that as we are running, as we are making changes, so Shiny is going to what react based on those changes uh, we are giving it to render it, then we get the return value in the, from the app. The book also said that once input and once input and output to stay in sync while minimizing computation, outputs and reactive expression change if and, and only if their input change. Then he said that reactive programming automatic, we have automatic updating, propagation of necessary changes. So as, as we are reacting with the app, so the app, we are getting instant uh, updates on the way we are reacting with the app as we are supplying inputs. We are going to have instant updates because the server is going to track those changes and is going to update and we get uh, the return value 
from the app. I don't know if there are any questions so that I can just stop before I go, go into the next section. Hello? If so good, so proceed. Okay. So in this section is talk about why can't you use uh, variables? So here, we are, it's a reactive program values that change over time. So here we create a simple, in this demo, we create a, a, a value which is term C. And in this term C, we assign a value of 10 to term C. Then we create another value here of term F, that is temperature in Fahrenheit. Then this value depends on term C. So we say term C multiplied by nine divided by five plus 32. So when we run term F, we get a return value of 50. But if, if we do make changes to term C, we, make, we modify our term C to 30 and we assign it back to, we assign that value of 30 to term C. But if we run our term F, we do not get an uh, automatic update because term F need we need to it, it, it did not we get not get we need to we need we did not get automatic updates on that app. So how do we solve how do we solve uh, this how do we solve this problem? We need to create uh, we use a function. Hey, I, yeah. I have a question, but okay. let's just go back. Okay. I, so for, for temp F to change, we have to run again temp F for us yes. to have now yes, yes. a different value than 50. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We need to run temp F again in order for us to get, for it to track that object date. But if you do not run temp F, you will still get 50 in the return value. So how do we solve that problem in Shiny? So the book kind of say we have to create a function. So here we create, assign a value of 10 back to term C. Then we create a function. And this function is just a simple function because we do not pass in any arguments. We do not pass in any arguments in the body of the function. We put message converting. Then we put uh, the, form, the formula there, which is our sim term C times nine over five plus 32. So if we run this function, if we run this function, we are going to, if we run this function and then we run them F, we are going to get a return value of 50. We are going to get a return value of 50. Then if we do make changes to them C, if we do make changes to them, modify them C, give it a value of minus three, then, if we run them F, we get instant updates. We get instant updates to them F. We get automatic updates, but we run into another problem. We, we run into another problem is that, the problem we run into is that the problem of automatic computation. Each, each time we are running them F, even though we have not made any changes, uh, the term F is going to recompute the value again. So in order for us to solve that problem of automatic computation, we need to go, we use a different approach. The book recommends that we have to go use a different approach, which is the event-driven programming. And in this event-driven programming, we use a callback function that run in response to the event. We use a callback function that will run in response to the event. And we also use another class, implement with R6 class in R. This is implemented with the R6 class in R. And how this in the book kind of explain this, that we need to create a dynamic value. And that dynamic value, we are going to set a value. We get we are going. Then we also on every update to that value, 
the callback function is going to make sure that we track those changes. And in the example in which they give here in the book, they have them see, they use the dynamic value, uh, then they assess dollar signs a new, assign this to them C. Then here, they use them C, then they say on updates, which is also a function of the value. Then here, they are using the two arrow sign, which is, I uh, think, in our discussion uh, this week in the advanced hour, we, uh, that is where I discovered there is, this is the super assignment operator in which we can use to as pick this value one level up in the environment. So what this is line is going to do is that it's going to pick this value and take it one level up, that is to them C. It's going to make sure it track every uh, changes we are making to them C. We are taking this value and move it one level up, such that if we set them C dollars and set, we set a value of 10. This is going to make sure that this function capture that changes we are making. So if we set them C dollar signs set, we set it to 10, then if we run them F, we are going to get a return value of 50. But if we, we, if we update that value, we set them C dollar sign set, we set it, we update it to, we put it as minus three and we run them F again. It's going to track, it's going to track that changes automatically and give us the give us the return value. Rather, so now, but what we are also encounter in this section is that when what I this, uh, understand about this section is that with this section we have been able to solve the problem of automatic uh, computation. But we run into another problem. The problem in which that we do not know which, which value is depending on which. So that the problem of dependency, we run into a new problem, which is the problem of uh, dependency. So what's the book kind of advice for us to solve because we do not know which value is depending on which. So in order for us to, to solve that problem, we need to go into the next section, which talk about uh, the reactive programming. And it said, reactive programming combined futures Sorry, of... I... Okay. Yes, I, I have a question. So it's, it's a bit general. Uh, please scroll up. Okay, um... I should go back to the last slide. Yes. So uh, this the dynamic value, the event, uh, no, no, no. It's down, yes, events-driven programming. Yes, yes, this particular function. So I am, I'm, I'm looking at a case where I have a variable in a column and these values are changing. So let's say the, the column itself, uh, the, the data is being updated on a daily basis. And I, I want to um, let to be, to be, to, uh, very simple is I have I have it convert uh, from uppercase to lowercase, just a function that can actually do that. Can yes. this be a, a good approach where that column is changing each and every time? So I I, I read such a function. Does that make sense? Mm, I think so. But that one is yeah the the value that column you are talking about string. Yes, so let's say it's a string and I've written a function that will convert uh, if, the, if the string is in capital letters and I want it to be in small letters. And this okay. particular column is changing. It's, it keeps on updating, like a new data will be coming in. Will such a function make sense to have? I doubt, I doubt, I doubt, because this one is, is only receiving numeric inputs. I doubt if this function will do that. I doubt. No, no, no. Because I, this I, one, this is where we are setting the value. And whatever value I set here is going, this is, is going to replace this value. And this them C is going to make sure because here we are using two arrow, that is the super assignment operation. Whatever value I pass here 
is going to make sure that them C track that value. And when we run them F, them F will return the value. It's going to make sure that this computation will take place and it's going to return this. Yeah, I, I, I realize that this function is dealing with numeric values, but my yes. question is, I write this function and uh, Ren, please, you can jump in and help me <laughs> uh, and help me in my question. So I have the, the, the line temp C dynamic value uh, dollar sign new. So that yeah. exists, but then yeah. uh, the function below is different. So the function yes. that I will write is a function that will convert the string which is in uppercase into lowercase. So my question is that colon keeps on updating itself. So will this just uh, the two, the temp C and the temp C dollar sign on update make sense yes. to have? Yes. Then what do you think? You could wrap that in a reactive yes. So what what um, Olu, what what Lucy is referring to is if she's got a data input for uh, the value of a named variable in this case temp C, but we can call it whatever we want because you've wrapped that in a reactive uh, expression. When you update that value, it's going to call on that function, which would uh, update and or place it in another named variable. So in this case, it'd be temp f. So the 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 actual function itself, uh, we're we're calling it value, but um, it's 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 the on update is actually the trigger. So because you're updating that value, and I know we're using these named uh, variables temp c and temp f, but let's just say that that temp c gets updated. You can wrap that in a reactive call so that it 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 calls on temp f, uses that update, and then pushes out that that uh, new value. In your case, it's string. So you've got your your uppercase, lowercase, uh, you know, mix match, a uh, mix case, a uh, mixed case string. You pass it into the function because it's a reactive. It will call on the the actual function update and then push out that new value. Uh, Reactive is, is special in the case of Shiny though. Um, I don't know if that would work. I would, I would recommend going a different route if we were just running this in a script. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recall or I wouldn't access or use the uh, concepts of reactivity uh, in, in just a common script case. It would be more on that Shiny side. And we're gonna find here a relationship that will be coming up here just briefly. Awesome. It Thank should you. make sense for you. Yeah, it'll it'll make sense here in just a moment. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your think. Think I was here in the we are in reactive programming. Okay. As I said, the reactive uh, programming combines futures of solution we have seen so far. So here we run library shiny uh, to, so that we can assess our function from the shiny app. But here now we are running reactive console true. We set it to true to get full access to the full reactivity of shiny instead of us to start the shiny app. But in this case, we are not starting the shiny app, but we are getting the full power function functions of reactivity uh, right inside our console in R. So here, we said temp C. Temp C, we use a reactive value, we set and we pass in a value of 10 to create a reactive value. And that value, we assign it uh, to temp C. So when we get run temp C, it return a value of 10, which is what we assign. So if we set them C to get to set a new value of 20. If you run them C, we get the return value. So the book also said that we can use a reactive uh, expression. We can use a reactive expression where we have them F, we use a reactive, we call our them C uh, times nine, over five plus 32. So when we run temp F, 
uh, it will get instant computation and a return value, which is uh, 68. So if we set our term C again to minus 10 and we run term F, it recomputes the shiny app, our app is going to recompute and give us a return value. But, but if our term C, our initial term C, if there is no changes, if they, we have not made any change and we run term F, it, the app is not going to recompute, or rather it's going to what catch our previous value in which we have, is going to catch that previous value and return it, which is 14, because we are not seeing any converting again in the app. Rather, it's going to return the previous value. But if them C, if we have made any changes uh, to them C, the app is going to run, recompute, and give us uh, a return value. So the book kind of explained the key concept of reactive expression that the reactive expression only, re only does work, that is, it's lazy because it only does work when it is being called. And also the second part is that it is catch because it saved the last result only does work on first call. So if the last result, we have not seen any changes on the last result, then if we run the term F, it's going to catch, it's going to catch the previous value and return that. But if we have modified them C, then the app is going to recompute and re give us uh, back a return value. And I can also say uh, the, the reactive expression, we only run the reactive expression for its, uh, we, do not need, we, do not need, we do not need it for any side effects. We do not, we run it, we, it has no side effects. And also it is, we, we can also say that the reactive expression is callable because once we call that reactive expression, though we know it is lazy, if we call it, we are going to get uh, a return value. So, and Call this, it, okay. it real quick, if you, yeah, let me, let me uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give uh, another example of that lazy and efficient uh, concept. Okay. So, okay. Um, the definition of cache memory. Uh, cache memory is always remember it's it's close to the CPU, right? So even your chipset, literally a a a, a a a processor on a motherboard has cache memory inside, and it's very close to the calculator itself, right? Um, then you move away from the from the chipset, and you get you know random access memory or RAM, right? Well, there's there's you can have cache memory in there as well. Um, it's very costly to go out to a hard drive and 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 process from that uh, point. And I'm just going to quickly run through a, a, a idea of what these different memory locations imply. So if if we were talking about cache memory, this would be like us, you know, leaving our home, running down to the convenience store, and coming back. Okay, it's it's very quick. It's a it's a five minute trip. Um, there's not a lot of of time spent in accessing that. Or sorry. Uh, acquiring some product that we're wanting uh, that we need. You're making dinner and you need uh, eggs. So you run down to the convenience store and you get eggs. If we talk about RAM, a random access memory, it's a little bit further from the CPU. Um, and so uh, RAM, you may have to go to another city, right? Um, maybe the city's, you know, I don't know, 50 miles away. So you're going to incur a larger cost to reach out to that other community to get your, your eggs. If you look at the hard drive, that's like literally flying to the moon and back. Okay, um, there's a lot of cost that is associated uh, with reaching out to that point and then coming back. There's a lot of time associated with it. All right, now this is really a poor example, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to express this onto a different concept, and that's just the networking concept. Okay, so you've got your user interface anywhere in the world. You've got this this laptop or desktop computer. And you have this server located in another location. Uh, in most cases, when we're doing these early tests, your server and UI are on the same machine, but let's just add the network into it and say that it's in another country. Right? When you talk cache memory, it is 
a, a stored value of, of what the user has based on what the server has given it, or as you input data. The word, uh, sorry, the word lazy, I want to, to, to change slightly. Um, the word efficiency actually comes into play as replacement for the word lazy. This efficient concept says, if I have that variable and it has not updated, I don't need to recalculate it. I don't need to incur the cost of processing that, that variable. However, if my user interface, my, my person that's communicating with the server, if they change a variable and it passes into the server, it's going to update that cache memory, right? Uh, or I guess the cache memory is on the user's end, but the, that cache memory is going to update, which means that it's no longer the same as what the server has. I need to go update and calculate a new value, right? So that the word lazy and efficiency, and then this relationship I'm expressing for cache memory is, is all part and partial to this, this awesomeness that is reactivity. I don't do any work. I don't incur any cost. I don't actually calculate anything until I know that a variable is updated uh, or a value for a named variable is updated, then I will incur the cost, process it, and send it back. So this whole idea of I'm going to, to stay exactly where I'm at, I'm not going to move until somebody tells me to move, that's really where this quote unquote lazy or this efficiency comment comes in. We don't actually update until something expressly says I need to, to update because of some change. Does that help? Oh, yes, I hope uh, I'm, I'm, I'm supporting yes, your comment. <laughs> yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you very awesome. Much. You bet. Okay. Okay. Like this section, the book talk about uh, the brief history of reactive programming, and it says uh, from the book is that if you have all, if you have used the spreadsheets before, then that means we have done reactive programming already because that is, you also get foundation from spreadsheets. He said it's not really studied, studied academically until late 1990, 2010, it was mainstream. So they also package also the other tools that also depend on uh, reactive is talk about the JavaScript UI framework, Knockout, Ember, Meteor, now React and Vue and also Angular. All these, they all depends uh, on the, the concepts of reactivity. And he said, reactive uh, programming is a general term, a lot of variability in implementation and terminology. So there, there might be some slight uh, differences, but the concept, the concept, the idea is still remains uh, the same. I think uh, that is all for my talk. That is all for the book. That's awesome. Thank so, you. Uh, uh, the Angular, uh, Angular is a tie into Google. Um, that's, a, that's a Google library. Um, Ember is related to Facebook uh, as a service. Um, I could throw in, uh, what's a, a node? Uh, well, let me, let me pause there. Node's a, node's a uh, library that accesses C. But um, these JavaScript libraries, just recall that they're they're nothing more than than functions, right? It's it's almost like your your package, and then inside the package is a bunch of function calls. We mix and match we mix and match all these packages together to pass variables back and forth between these multiple functions. So now with Shiny, you're changing your viewpoint from just R as a a language, right? And now we're moving into this more JavaScript oriented language. Um, if you want to view the Worldwide Consortium, uh, or, or W3C is the, is the short name for it, um, ECMAScript is JavaScript. Uh, ECMA is the, is the uh, uh, not the brand name, it's the, it's the actual name assigned to JavaScript. Um, that's a shorthand for, for us to recognize. But um, ECMA, if you, if you get into their documentation or start reading some of the content in there, it almost reads similar to what we're, we're dealing with in vignettes or uh, manuals, uh, uh, function calls, help, help menus. Um, these different libraries have flavors to them. Uh, they do things a little differently uh, between each uh, party. And so depending on how you want to access that library or what, what kind of efficiency you're wanting to pull from that library, you have that, those, uh, 
uh, selections. If you didn't know, if you didn't realize, uh, and, and I'm not trying to wow anybody here, but um, RStudio as a IDE, uh, integrated development environment, when you load RStudio on your computer, it's not actually a program or not necessarily a program. It's actually built on Chromium. Um, so the, the uh, RStudio as a IDE is actually a web page. It's a, it's a web browser that you're interacting with. Um, and that kind of blew my mind. Um, Olu, do you have R up and running? And I'm not asking to, to switch gears on you at all. Uh, yes, yes, yes. If you, if you want to briefly pull up uh, RStudio uh, real quick okay. to, your, to your visible window here. Okay. Now, from this particular page, right, this is all very familiar to us. Um, everything that we see here is, is, is uh, uh, we're comfortable with. Um, yeah. Hit just anywhere on your screen, uh, hit the uh, key command F12. Um, I believe F12 enters developer mode. Command Double F12 sh is not coming up. Uh, try function F12. Let me, uh, let me, Double check on my end that I'm giving you the right command here. There we go. Sorry, right, waiting for our studio to start on my end. For me, it's function F12, but um, it may be different on a Windows computer as well. Um, F12 is usually developer mode in a browser. Uh, most common browsers have some level of developer mode built into it. And what I was hoping to do is take your particular screen and then enter the, the uh, underwebbing of, of this service. Um, Command F12 is not bringing out the developer mode yet. Yeah, it's not on mine either. Okay, try this then. So put your, put your cursor at like temp F, uh, maybe line 119 on your script. And then just right click and ask to inspect. Okay. Inspect element. Uh, there we go. Yes. Now, yes. what's good? What'll happen is another browser will open uh, or yes. another window will open. And what you're going to see here is just a bunch of JavaScript or HTML. Let me so, share the screen so that. You bet. There we go. If. So ultimately, I guess what I'm what I'm hoping to highlight, and this is going to be for future use or future plans, but the idea that that we interact in a web framework without even realizing that we're acting in a web framework. Uh, so when you're interacting with Web Studio, uh, sorry, our Studio as a as a uh, uh, authoring platform on your computer, underneath that service is this web framework. Um, the idea behind this uh, different JavaScript libraries as we express into uh, the concept of the reactive uh, service and, and, and its implication uh, between a UI and a server. Um, all I want to do is try and create this distance so that uh, uh, we're not confused on, well, it's all just on my computer. Well, sure it is because your server and your UI are on the same machine. Right, so it's a very efficient uh, translation of media. If we were to, to extend this though, if we were to create a geographic barrier, this, this large network between our user interface and our server, well, now I, I have to incur the cost of this network translation as well, right? This TCP IP type translation that occurs between uh, parties. And so the reactive, lazy, efficient loading concept that's where it becomes very, very vital. Um, we may have thousands, tens of thousands of people accessing our shiny app, right? The server itself and all of the various threads that everyone is requesting from that. The server is not going to be calculating a bunch of data if it doesn't need to. It's only when somebody expressly asks for an update, then the server will send that back. And that's that reactive uh, stance that it's taking. I won't do anything until I'm expressly told to, then I will pass the information to you. Okay. Does that help? Yes. 
uh, don't get lost in here. Um, there's other books that cover not so much just, just our studio as an IDE, a, but this concept of, of JavaScript and, and its language uh, relationship. Um, it, it, it's always based on the server and the UI. And that's just web, web development in general. And there is a book club on that set, JavaScript for R. Yep. Uh, Russ Hyde is uh, facilitating that book at the moment. Um, I think we're on chapter nine, chapter 10. Um, I signed up for one of the upcoming chapters. I'll be, I'll be covering that topic soon. Okay. Check this, I think. Uh, you can just close this window. You're not going to do any any harm to anything. <laughs> okay, I think that's all. Okay, thank you, Oyedele and Ryan for the awesome contribution. <laughs> yeah, there's always something new that you can learn aside from the chapter itself. So yeah, um, we'll meet next week for chapter 14. Um, Brendan had registered for it. Hopefully he'll still take it, uh, lead the discussion, but if not, of course, Ren and I will always discuss who will uh, lead the discussion. Yes, Ren. Brendan, Brendan is in our, our, our packaging book club and he's in the midst of transition at the moment. So uh, okay. I haven't heard from him. Um, he, popped his, uh, he popped into our Wednesday call, um, but I know there's some, some uh, activity on his part uh, that he's dealing with. So. He sh should be around next week, but uh, I'll send him a, a note to confirm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I I wish Ren a good morning and uh, oh, Lily and I, I I wish you a good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. See you next week. Bye.